That because wherever we go, we're taking the gospel. Wherever we go, we're winning souls. Wherever we go, we're seeing the glory of God. This is just a place to receive more of the Lord and encouragement in the brethren so that when you go out, you go out in the power of God. That's why we don't sugarcoat things. That's why we weep and cry at the altar. That's why we experience the presence of the Lord and we're reaching out for the things of God. That's why we are not compromising the gospel because we know that when we gather, it's only supposed to, we're supposed to be growing together as a family so that when we go out, we change this nation and this land. If you can, open up your Bibles. Go with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And I want you to just begin to believe God for your miracle. Begin to believe God for your blessing. Begin to believe God for answers to your questions today in Jesus' name. There's no limit to what God can do in your life. Amen? There's no limit. So let's just go and stretch out and believe God. Stretch your faith and believe God for whatever you need. Just go and take it in the name of Jesus. Amen? And in John chapter 4... Beginning verse 1, I'm going to read a little bit here. Beginning verse 1, it says, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field of Jacob, gave to his sons Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his, his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. She said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? Beside, do you think you're greater than our ancestors, J Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth, sir, the woman said. You must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship? While the Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, Gerizim where our ancestors worship. Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship while we Jews know all about him for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. 
When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Now go with me to verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay with, stay in the village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Come on, give God praise for his word. Amen. You know, it's so funny when you read, when, when you read the scriptures with new eyes. With new eyes. Sometimes we hear the word of God so many times that we just, we kind of skim through things and we miss so much. I want to tell you, there's a lot in the Bible that you just don't know. You might have been reading the, you might have been hearing the word since the time you were born, but there's a lot there that you don't know. And every scripture there has a new revelation for you. And if you open up your heart and allow the Holy Spirit to hope to, to show you, he'll show you new things that you've never seen before. And you know, I was so blessed by hearing the story because this woman had attitude. Here, Jesus, you know, he's, he's thinking, I'm thirsty, I'm tired, I'm weary from this journey. I want some water. That's all he wanted. He's just, you know, thinking he just want, wanted water. And I know what that's like, you know, you've been doing ministry and you're tired and you've been serving, you've been doing everything God called you to do. Now you're just tired and you just want to eat. You just want to rest. And, and, you know, so he just wanted water and he saw his opportunity to get water. She had a bucket. He didn't have a bucket. So she went, he, he, he went to her and said, Hey, can I have some water? And she responded with an attitude. You want water from me? You're a Jew. You all have been ignoring us, not even talking to us, and now you're asking water from me? She saw herself as, hey, I got something that this man wants, that he's willing to break all the rules of society to talk to someone who is, who in his mind, might, they, they, they might think that I'm beneath them. But you have to understand the gospel's for the poor. And Jesus immediately, when he heard her words, he immediately, the things of the Holy Spirit were rising up on the inside of him. He said, listen, if you knew who was asking for water, you would ask of me for water, for the water I give is living water. And you will never thirst again. And he began to minister to her in her brokenness. And not only did he minister to her about the things of God, but he began to prophesy and reveal even the secrets of her heart where after she heard the words of Jesus, not only was she blessed, but she knew without a shadow of doubt, this is the Messiah, the Son of God. She tasted and seen that the Lord is good. When she had finally received the only one that could give her the water that will quench her thirst, that will fill the void that's in her life. Apparently, it wasn't a husband or relationship that that could fulfill the void. 
Apparently, it wasn't a position in, in, in some, side of, some sort of social class that could fill the void. Apparently, it wasn't money, wealth, or anything in this world that could fulfill the void. Only the living water that comes from Jesus Christ could fulfill the void. And she tasted and saw that the Lord was good. As soon as she grabbed a hold of this is the Messiah, the son of the living God. He has living water that when you drink of it, you will not thirst again. She didn't just keep it to herself. She went and gathered all that were lost and said, I found the Messiah. Come and see the Son of God. And she brought them. I'm telling you, the Bible says in the last days, the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the water covers the seas. I want to tell you, it's going to be women that are going to take the gospel to nations. Because men kind of get intimidated, but you get a woman excited about something, they will not shut their mouth. That's one thing I've realized. When, when, when a lady's excited about something, they're going to tell somebody something. Amen. They don't care what people, they don't care what people think about them. They're going to open up their mouths. I'm telling you, you get your wife stirred up, you might be saying, honey, calm down. Honey, oh, I'm coming down. What did you do to my kid? <laughs> Ready to take on the world. And this woman, she went out and she won. She brought all her village to Jesus. And after two days, they were all saved. They were all saved. They testified. They said, not only do we, we, we believe that he is the Messiah, not just because of what you said, but because we tasted and seen that he is good. Hallelujah. How awesome is our God? You, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to remind my wife this today. But today is our anniversary of 11 years of being pastors of Faith Please God Church. Happy anniversary. Hallelujah. And we're getting younger. It gets gooder and gooder. Amen. And so we've been pastoring the church for 11 years. And so we're beginning our 12th today. The prayer that I went before God when, when the Lord put me as, in position as a pastor, I would say this. I said, Father, the prayers and the cries and the hurts and the pain, the things that you hear over this land, from the woman that was abused and she's crying out for mercy or the person that's lost and, and crying out says, is, is there a God? All those prayers and those cries that you hear over this land, I said, Father, let me hear them too. And Father, give me an anointing to answer. Because people of God, you are here to make an impact in this world. But it's not because of your strength, but it's because of the strength of the Lord. It's the anointing of God that comes upon your life so that you could do things that only God can do. And many of you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And some of you, maybe you have never met Jesus. Today, you're going to meet him because he's here today. You're going to get saved. Amen. It's not a might. It's not a maybe. You're going to get saved. Why? Because when you see the glory of God, you're going to have to run to the light. Amen. Amen. He's so good. He loves you. But when you've seen and tasted and seen that the Lord is good, it is your responsibility not just to receive Jesus, but then you have to go back to where you came from and bring him to them. I was so blessed to hear this one family that, that they, they rededicated their life to God and they started getting in the ways of the Lord. And the very first thing they did was they gathered their children and began to talk about Jesus and begin to read the Bible to each other and begin to speak about the things of God. And then they began to reach out to their family members and people that, that they know that are hurting and they began to minister to them and just tell them the simplicity that we found Jesus and he is alive and he loves you because he loves me too. And I know if he could do it in my life, he could do it in your life. He could say you, you can change you, you can bless you. You have to understand that we all are called to the ministry of evangelism. We are not called to sit down in a church. 
I thank God for those comfortable chairs that you're sitting in. I thank you that, I thank God that some of you have already broken that chair in and it fits perfectly according to your size. And if you sat in another, if someone sat in that chair, you look at them kind of like, that's going to be the last time. I'm showing up 10 minutes early to beat you next time. I, I thank God for that. I thank God for your presence here. But here should be only a place that you receive enrichment, that you receive strength, that you receive revelation so that you could go out there and make an impact. There are a lot of churches that are, that are, that are thinking that the church is evangelical center and we are not an evangelical center. We are a house of praise. We are a house of worship. We're here to give God the glory, but we're also here to grow in the word of God so that when we go out, that becomes the house of the evangelist house. That be, wherever we go, we're taking the gospel. Wherever we go, we're winning souls. Wherever we go, we're seeing the glory of God. This is just a place to receive more of the Lord and encouragement in the brethren so that when you go out, you go out in the power of God. That's why we don't sugarcoat things. That's why we weep and cry at the altar. That's why we experience the presence of the Lord and we're reaching out for the things of God. That's why we are not compromising the gospel because we know that when we gather, it's only supposed to, we're supposed to be growing together as a family so that when we go out, we change this nation and this land. And we need the anointing. We need Jesus. We need the living water. To bubble up and pour out. Everywhere you go, you should leave a puddle. A good puddle. Everywhere you go, goodness and mercy should follow you. Everywhere you go, people should, should be able to say, that something happened. When he spoke, something was happening in my heart. You have the life of God. You are the light of the world. Wherever you go, darkness should run away from you. Your very presence, you showing up, brings the presence of God. And in his presence is peace. In his presence is joy. You just showing up in your house, your house should get happy because you're there. Some people say, well, not my house, pastor. It's like World War III going on in there. I guarantee you, if you change the environment, you, you, you begin to, to praise God in that house, that spirit of division and anger and fear will leave that place. That sickness spirit that's been operating in that house will leave that place. I'm telling you, if, you, if you're in a home that everybody gets sick, it goes from one thing to another, there is a spirit of infirmity that needs to be dealt with. You need to kick that devil out in the name of Jesus. You will not touch my family. You will not touch my children. You will not touch my body. We are healed in the name of Jesus. Get out out devil you got to tell them you got to tell them some of you are waiting well maybe if pastor kevin shows up to my house and anoints every door and yes we do that we love to do that but you got to become the great man of god or the great woman of god too the same holy spirit in me is the same holy spirit in you it's the same holy spirit that's in jesus jesus said the things that i do you will do too Amen. Why? Because we're walking in fellowship with the Lord. But we cannot forget those that we walk, that we've come out of, the places we come out of. We cannot forget those that we've left behind. We have to grab the things of God and go back to them and tell them what the Lord has done for you. There are family members and friends that need to know Jesus Christ through your lips through your life. And you might say, well, pastor, they've seen the worst of me. That's why you are the, the greatest testimony. Because they know that when you go and you speak about the love of God, they will look at you and say, that's not you. I don't know who you are, but that's not you. 
You're the person that was cursing every word. You're the person that was doing every drug. You're the person that was always messed up and always had death upon you. But whoever you are in front of me, that's not you because you got joy. You got peace. You got life. There's something about you that's completely different than the way you used to be. That's the testimony of the blood of Jesus Christ that has worked in your life to set you free, change you, and now is using you for his glory. You cannot keep your mouth shut. You have to go to the loss. You know who the lost is. You have to go to those places where you came out of to bring the love of God there. You have to tell them what God has done for you. And as you tell them what God has done for you, the Holy Spirit will work with you. As soon as Jesus began to describe the living water, the anointing of God came upon him to prophesy. The fruit of the Spirit came upon him and he began to prophesy. People of God, we are working together with, with God. God does not expect us to minister and to witness and tell people about his love in our own power. He's just looking for vessels that will carry his presence and his power to those that are hurting. Whatever is needed to bring them to Christ will be there for you. If you need an anointing from heaven to prophesy a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, a miracle, a gift of healing, a gift of faith to come, whatever is needed for them to, to be saved will be provided for you. Why? Because the Father loves them so much and he's willing to do whatever it takes to bring them into his family, to bring them back home. They are the lost and we are the found. The found must go out and bring back the lost. How will they know about God if we don't keep, if we don't open up our mouth? How will they know about God if we don't preach? We are preachers. We are evangelists. We are people that carry fire and set fire everywhere we go. The fire of the Holy Ghost. We are the ones that carry the anointing of God. We have the ability to receive power from heaven to change this world. All it takes from you is just a little bit of faith. Just a little bit of faith. That when you stand in front of them, that the Lord will give you the words. That the Lord will give you the words. Number one, you got to love them. You have to love them. Because if you can't love them, you can't minister to them. Faith works through love. And because you love them, you'll spend time praying. You'll spend time asking God for the secrets to unlock their heart so that they can receive him as their Lord and Savior. So you start praying for them through that love. And then when you stand before them, you begin to share your testimony. All you have to do is say your story. Just tell them your story. You know, I, I, someone asked me the other day, Pastor, how do you bring someone who used to know God and walked away, a, a backslidden person back to God? I tell them, I just tell them what God's doing in my life and they get jealous. They do, they get jealous. They get jealous because once you taste and see that the Lord is good, you just, you, you know, you don't want anything else but the Lord. And the enemy comes and he tries to steal and kill and destroy. And the enemy is a liar. Don't mean you know that the devil's a liar. And he lies to people thinking that, man, you should walk away. And they forget who they are. But when you start telling people about what the Lord has done, I'm telling you, they start getting stirred up. They start getting jealous. They start saying, I want some of that living water again, too. I remember how God was, how God blessed me, how God took care of me, how God came to me and ministered to me. That's why you have to share your testimony over and over and over. Someone says, well, pastor, how many times do I have to tell my testimony? As long as you're living you tell your testimony you don't stop talking about what God has done for you Kelly is going to be 92 years old and he's going to be standing on a pulpit one day I went to see a man who was working on a car he laid hands on me and the Holy Ghost fell on me and then he looked at me and just began to laugh ha 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 People 
all going to be blessed by that. Because it's his story. It's his testimony of victory. But it will, it will encourage them to go get their own. Jesus is able to save the world, but he's using people like you and me. Amen. Tell your neighbor, you got to go back. You have to go back. You can't stay the same. You have to go back. You have to go back to the loss. You have to go back and win your brother. You have to go back and win your sister. You have to go back and win that, that, that guy that, and that girl that you used to do drugs with. You have to go back and win that person that, that used to do all those negative things with. You have to go back because they know you. They know who you used to be, but when they meet you, they're not going to meet you. You're dead to who you used to be. They just see the body, but they haven't seen the spirit. But when you open up your your mouth they're gonna see the glory of God they're gonna see the goodness of God they're gonna say whatever happened to you I want that too amen hallelujah I remember this one lady in my in 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 the church when I when I started as a youth pastor uh you all already known that I'm 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 a little different but so are you you're peculiar. And but when I became a youth pastor, all the Christian kids left the, 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 the youth group. I don't know why, but, you know, parents said don't go there anymore. Literally, parents said you don't, you're not going to youth no more. Why? Be oh, because him. I was the kind of youth pastor that parents didn't want their youth to be around. But the reason why was because I never went after the Christian kids. I went to the streets and brought in the gangs and brought in those that, that nobody wanted. So when, 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 when they showed up, everybody was, you know, acting like the world. And I wanted them. And so we would go to the streets and we would win souls just going to the parks. We'd walk the streets during, the, during Saturday nights, Sunday nights, minister, uh, Friday nights winning souls. We'd stand in the front of the movie theater with 60 kids there and, and, and they'd be shouting the prayer of salvation. That was our nature just to go win the loss and we'd bring them in and when they would come in, they would, I'm telling you, they, they would be broken. They would, they would look like the world but they tasted and they seen that the Lord was good. And they were so hungry for the things of God and they would go out to the street and win, win their, their, their friends. One young man, this one young man, he came in from Phoenix, Arizona. He came right at the end of, uh, the, of the, the school year. He got here like on May 31st and we began this leadership discipleship course for the youth where we did 30 days of just pouring into the, into the youth. And so he got here the day before he gave his life to Jesus, our first service. The next day, he shows up in the morning. We begin our discipleship, and he gets filled with the Holy Ghost. That same day, he went on the street with us and led his first person to Jesus, one to one. He was only with me for 30 days, and he led over 200 people to Christ. Yeah. He was so excited about God. He was like that woman at the well. Come and hear every here what someone who has told me everything about me someone who has living water someone that has changed my life come and he would win souls everywhere